Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the IFG. Welcome back to those of you who joined us this morning for our first session of our one-day conference on government reform. My name's Hannah White, and I'm Deputy Director of the Institute for Government, and delighted that you can all be with, here with us today for this second session, uh, where we're going to focus on the question of policy making, which is a question which has really occupied uh, the Institute for Government since it was first set up. Um, we feel we're quite clear about what the problems are with policy making. Um, we feel the model of generalism in uh, Whitehall continues to be an issue. It continues to mean that there's high degree of turnover of policy officials who don't stay in place long enough to, maintain, to build and maintain expertise which can really inform policy making. Uh, we feel there are frequent failures to consider implementation uh, when policy is being developed. Um, and how those policies can be delivered. There, can, there are problems with cross-government co coordination and a tendency to short-termism. So if those are the problems, why haven't they been solved? The question is, you know, many people uh, have identified these very same issues, uh, but why have attempts to address those, those issues not worked? What are the underlying problems? But today, we don't want to simply rehearse what's going wrong. Uh, we want to talk about the ideas that the Institute has about how those problems can be solved, what the barriers may be to those problems being implemented, and how we can move forward. And I'm delighted to say we've got a fantastic panel with us today to discuss these questions. Uh, we have Andrew Carter, who is Chief Executive of the Centre for Cities. Uh, we have Anna Isaac uh, uh, in the middle here, who's Economics Editor of The Independent. Uh, Rachel Wolfe, founding partner of Public First and co-author of the 2019 Conservative uh, Election Manifesto. Uh, and uh, Tom Sass, who is associate director here at the IFG, who it, uh, at the moment is going, in a moment is going to speak about our research report, which I have here. Um, and then virtually from York, we are joined, I'm delighted to say, by Paul Kissack, who, of course, is Group uh, Chief Executive of the Joseph Roundtree Foundation and Joseph Roundtree Housing Trust and a former senior official here in the UK and in New Zealand. So a big welcome <coughs> to you all. Um, and I'd like to start by asking Tom uh, to just outline uh, the analysis in our report on better policymaking. Thanks, Hannah. Uh, thanks, everyone who's made it here on a, a busy... Uh, political day and thanks everyone for watching online. Um, so I'm going to optimistically start by saying this is a, a good moment for reflection on UK government policy making. We obviously had a sort of period of political upheaval uh, and I think it's fair to say that at times it's felt like the oxygen has somewhat been sucked out of the policy debates and the kind of really uh, debating the, the, the sort of big issues about the way forward. Um, but we are approaching an election. We're not quite sure how fast we're approaching that election. Um, and that election is likely to be the first in, in, you know, what, about a decade that will be sort of primarily focused on the dom domestic policy agenda, and there'll be more space for that. And I think if, if you listen carefully, you can sort of hear the signs of some attention turning back to that debate. Um, so as, as Hannah says, you know, policymaking has been um, a major focus for IFG over our sort of 13-year history. Um, and, you know, obviously policy making is at the core of, of what it is to govern. It's about how government approaches choices and trade-offs and whether governments really are able to achieve the things that they set out to do. Um, so IFG isn't in the business of advocating policy A or, or policy B, as you'd expect, um, but we are really interested in understanding why A works and why B doesn't. Um, so throughout our time, we've done things like ask, asking questions like, how was an idea developed? How strong was the evidence behind it? What options were considered? Were they properly understood? Where was the public and the parliament, and parliament on the issue? Uh, what discussions took place between ministers and officials? Who else was involved in the policy process? And was there a, a proper plan for delivery? Uh, back in 2013, uh, my colleague Jill Rutter developed a set of policy fundamentals, uh, things which we thought were really important for government to do as part of the process. And that included things like clarity on goals, uh, open and evidence-based idea generation, and responsive external engagement. And of course, there's no single right answer to addressing uh, a policy problem. Much of this is the kind of best messy business of, of compromise and building consensus. Um, but we think that if you have 
clear aims, you can then assess how well those are met. Um, so over that whole uh, period, we've looked to draw a lot of lessons from case studies. Like everyone else, we've poured over some of the failures and where things have, have gone wrong. Uh, we looked at universal credit, and you can sort of see in those troubled early years how the policy was undermined by some unrealistic aims, you know, a good news culture in the Department for Work and Pensions, and the constant change of, of key officials in charge of uh, delivering it, and that's an issue I'm, I'm sure we'll come back to. Uh, we've looked at probation, where actually a narrow focus on cu cutting costs and actually a lack of understanding of really how hard it would be to, to contract out the delivery of what is a complex human service, again, sort of undermined a big program, right up to current issues and the delay to the first lockdown, uh, where we looked at sort of chaotic structures of decision making and a lack of an overarching strategy, which really undermined how decisions were taken. Um, I think it's important to say that failures like those get a lot more attention in the media and probably to be fair from researchers like us. Um, but there have also been many policies which lived up to the sort of lofty aspirations that we set for policy making. And, and we've aimed to draw lessons from those as well. Um, so if we look at, in the mid-2000s, key changes to address pensioner poverty uh, and the way Adair Turner and the, and the Pensions Commission really built a consensus around a problem um, before then advocating a, a really ambitious set of solutions. Uh, you can look at legislation on same-sex marriage. This is an issue that we're going to be doing a policy reunion on later this year. And actually how effectively the, the ministers and officials involved managed to kind of bring stakeholders on board and neutralise any potential opposition. You can look back to the success of the Rough Sleepers Unit in the, in the late 1990s. And there you saw all the levers of government really being pulled together to address a social ill. So sort of housing, welfare and health. And more recently on the furlough, I mean, there may be criticism of fraud levels on that scheme, but actually there was absolute clarity on aims at the start about what mattered being speed, uh, scale and simplicity. So I just say that at the start because I think it's worth pre prefacing the kind of conversation we're about to have um, by saying that there are a lot of things that UK government gets right um, still and a lot of successful uh, policies. However, um, the starting point for the report that Alex and I wrote and that we're talking about today um, was that there is also a less rosy story to tell. Uh, and that story is really twofold. Um, so the first bit is that the success side of the ledger is too slim and the failure side is too large as a result of some persistent weaknesses in the way UK government works. And then the second is that on that failure side of the ledger, are a set of chronic issues, as we've described them. So really, many of the biggest questions facing the country and the things that really matter to people's lives, that actually successive governments, and this is not about even criticizing the current government particularly, and successive generations of policymakers have proved really unable to grapple with. And here we're thinking of issues like social care, house building, uh, obesity and drug misuse, regional economic policy, further and technical education, which, which David mentioned at the start of the session, and so on. You could, you could mention many more. Um, so what's striking about that list of chronic issues that I've just given is that I think they're all areas that would be classed as long-term policy areas. And this comes on to my, my f the first of our big sort of five problems, which is, is short-termism. And I think in all of these areas, you know, systems and behaviours are entrenched making inroads with policy is very difficult. Uh, it's not about one good speech or even one good white paper, but sort of years of patient work and focus, reflection improvement, stable political support, and the right institutions to deliver change. Uh, and actually, we thought, reflecting on this, that the UK government is simply not set up to do that. Uh, we have ministers with often very little prior experience being moved very quickly between posts, much quicker than counterparts in other countries. We did a bit of comparative analysis on that. Um, and you also have officials moving around very quickly too, which is an, uh, an issue that we'll come back to. And I think that means that the incentive is often for a minister to sort of make their mark or make a new announcement to try and get a bit of recognition rather than continue the work uh, that has been done before them. 
Uh, so really, no one involved in the policymaking process has a, a strong incentive to focus on the, the sort of five to 10 year time horizon. It's not helped, of course, by often there being a lack of cross-party consensus on, on many of these big issues, which is a really difficult challenge. Um, on top of that incentive on, official, on, on individuals, I think you have issues with the system. So you have poor knowledge management and record keeping. Um, so re really, this adds up to government not only being short-sighted, but also having short memory. Um, and that's not the sort of smart government that we, we want. And all of that is reinforced, that short-term focus, by the Treasury in particular, and the way the Treasury focuses on short-term financial control rather than some of the long-term ambitions that a government has. So that's number one. Second big weakness we point to is lack of policy knowledge. Um, this is a really, really big one for us, as Hannah and, and David have said already today. Um, I think this can get relegated to the category of sort of persistent grumble or age-old criticism of government. Um, someone at some point will point out that this was in the Fulton report, and it sort of goes back 50 years. Um, but actually, I think our body of work, our case studies, but also our conversations with officials, with ministers, suggest that it is really, really debilitating to the ability of government being able to do what it wants to do. Uh, it's hard to imagine how you make progress on some of those chronic issues I've just mentioned if you don't have people involved in the policy making who really truly understand the policy. And it's hard to work out how you do that if you have people moving around very frequently. Uh, this has other knock-on problems. So it means both ministers can get poor advice. And I'll come on to a, a bit around the, the accountability for the quality of advice. But it also means that ministers don't get challenged enough on, 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 on the ideas that they have. Uh, there are, of course, many exceptions to this, many brilliant civil servants who do have deep policy expertise. But if you look across the civil service, um, I think the trend is that, that officials do not have incentives to stay in post and develop that expertise. Um, th this was recognized in the declaration of government reform, I should say. But I think what we see now is that the, the interest in that seems to be waning. And as with other sort of attempts at reforming this area, there's a sort of a, a lack of momentum. Uh, the third one is, is poor implementation. So here, the kind of classic description or the criticism has been that the UK is good at policy but poor at delivery. Um, and project management has been the key weakness. We don't have those skills. I think in the early 2010s, that was true. Um, I remember the sort of IPA writing a sort of series of withering reports about the government's management of the major projects portfolio. Um, you can look back at some of those debacles of that era slightly earlier the Rural Payments Agency or, or problems over NHS medical records. And they really exemplified that, the sort of lack of, uh, of real delivery expertise. Now I think the problem is actually a bit more subtle. Uh, it's about a lack of, not, not so much about the lack of delivery skills, whether there's actually been a real improvement in government over the last 10 years or so, and more about the lack of join up between policy and delivery. So policy being made without delivery being in the room, and actually the teams being treated completely separately. Um, this really came home for me when I was talking to a former DEC official uh, who was involved in the Green Deal, which was a, a failed scheme for home energy efficiency. And he described how that policy had been chucked over the fence to delivery with just the kind of, the, the sort of vain hope that they would be able to sort of handle it without actually much understanding of the delivery challenges involved. Um, and we could see the Green Homes Grant sort of very much followed in the, in the footsteps there. Uh, our fourth one is poor cross-government working. Again, not a new or original point, but I think really does undermine, um, particularly on some of the, the real cross-government, uh, cross-cutting areas, if you think of net, net zero and leveling up, where you have different departments simply pulling in different directions. Um, you don't necessarily have strong incentives or necessarily the structures um, for, to en encourage that cooperation. Uh, one thing we have praised is the use of uh, some of the cabinet committees under this government um, and sort of operational and strategic um, committees, but I don't think that's, that's fully solved this problem. And it comes back slightly to having uh, a centre that isn't capable of organising across government in the way that you might want. And I think, again, some of the ways the Treasury works militates against that. Final problem that we point to, and this is again quite a big one, is the idea of Whitehall parochialism. So this is the idea that central government is really too closed off to both the expertise and the experience it, it, experiences that are held 
outside of Whitehall. And here we're thinking of a range of bodies from local government and business, but also the ex experience of the public. So not only not expert enough, but not curious enough about the exper expertise held by others. Um, I think we saw this with regard to local government during COVID. Uh, you know, central government being too willing to dismiss actually the expertise that local government had that central government may not have had. Uh, and I think there's a bigger question for us here, which we have colleagues working on at the IFG about the extent to which policymaking responsibilities might be devolved uh, beyond Whitehall. Um, but we also see it with, in other areas. So we can look at with regard to um, academia and external research and the, the sort of weak links in terms of how government brings expertise into Whitehall. But I think possibly the biggest of these is, is, is the way that public uh, experiences are brought into policymaking. And here you can see there's a real sort of step change happening in some parts, in some countries, and, and actually in some parts of local government in terms of using public engagement in policymaking and really pushing beyond sort of traditional focus groups and, and polling to think much more deeply about how the public experience policy issues. But I think Whitehall is, is really lagging behind on that. Um, there's still a kind of old fashioned view among too many officials and ministers that this is unnecessary or a burden and not really required for policymaking. Um, so recommendations, I realize that that is an absolutely massive <laughs> set of problems that we've just uh, described there. And I'm fully prepared for the sort of accusation that some of these recommendations that I'm going to come up with are either sort of not realistically going to bring about the sort of sea change that we might hope for, or perhaps that they're not radical enough. We sometimes get accused of that uh, at the IFG. So I'm, I'm really interested and want to sort of test some of the things that we say um, with, with, with what other, everyone else has to say. But, but we think that the ideas we've put forward in this paper provide potentially a sort of foundation for some of the changes that, that we want to see. Um, so the first bucket of things is around accountability for advice, decisions and outcomes. Alex talked about this this morning as well. Um, and really what we think we need here is a much clearer system for separating out these accountabilities at each stage of the policy process. So really the lines have become too blurred and that does not help us sort of focus on, on good policy making. For civil servants, we think that you need a clear head of policy in each department who's responsible for the quality of policy advice and overseeing policy making in that department. Uh, you might think that we have that already, but we don't. We have a sort of permanent secretary and a, a series of policy DGs. Um, but what that means is you don't necessarily have one person who, who's really accountable for the quality of that. And drawing back to the discussion earlier, we think that that person actually needs to be responsible for the rigor of quality advice, qu rigor of policy advice regardless of the particular tastes of one minister or another. So there's a permanent role for the civil service in ensuring that they are evidence-based and, and, and sort of on top and able to sort of command that area, steward that area, regardless of, of particular changes in minister. If advice sort of falls short of that standard, it should be clear who's responsible in the civil service. Um, and also we think that a change, potentially quite a significant change actually, and Margaret Hodge touched on it this morning, that would support this would be making much more policy advice transparent. Uh, of course, some discussions between minister, uh, ministers and officials need to be private. There is that space, but actually much of it doesn't, we would argue. Um, and I think it would strengthen, the pu strengthen sort of public trust, but also the general conversation around policies and how they're adopted um, if the public could see more of, of, of the inputs into policy decisions. Uh, this is absolutely not impossible. You can look at what happens in local government, as Margaret said. You can look at what happens in New Zealand, and, and Paul might cover uh, some of that. We also think, in terms of this accountability for outcomes question, if a project really fails badly, then actually the civil servant responsible for that and the delivery of that should not necessarily move seamlessly up the ladder, as we've seen in some cases. So we actually really need to think about this accountability across um, the whole stages of policy making. In terms of ministers, um, ultimately that comes from the Prime Minister. Um, and we've sort of wrestled somewhat uh, in writing this paper that if the signal from the top is not right in terms of caring about good policy making and the inputs to that, that can be quite hard to correct for. Um, but I think you know, if you look at the ministers in each department, clearly they are responsible for creating the right culture in a department, for encouraging honest and challenging advice. And also they have a responsibility not to be uh, 
passive recipients of advice, but actually to test it themselves. And we, we talked about that in some of our COVID research, where perhaps it was sort of too willing to accept that something was the final answer on a question. Uh, and on outcomes, uh, we're, we're calling for ministers and officials to be, continue to be recalled three, four, five years after a policy decision was taken to answer on the outcomes of that policy and actually try and draw that line between a decision and the outcomes much more clearly. Um, you know, that's something we've been calling for for some time that it's been difficult to get traction with, but I think that is a, a possible route to change. Uh, our second bucket, uh, there's a second of three, um, more expertise and skills in policy teams. Um, we've, we've outlined at length sort of some of the issues we think there are with policy expertise. I think there's four main changes I would point to on this one. The first is tackling excessive turnover. I won't go into huge detail here on how we suggest you do that, but it's mostly around promotion as well as pay and changing a general workforce culture in the civil service. Um, it is possible to do it. Some departments have started to do it. What we haven't seen is a, a real shift across government to try and change that, possibly a, a priority for the next chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster uh, when they get appointed. Um, the second is to replace the sort of generalist model with career anchors. Um, so at the moment, you see too many officials sort of pinballing around a, a real breadth of different policy careers rather than planning their career within a kind of policy sphere. So we've talked about things like education, defense and security, net zero, as possible kind of career anchors that you could plan a bit more of a career in. The third is creating roles for deep policy experts and actually rewarding that expertise, allowing them to continue to progress through the civil service and not necessarily needing to take on management responsibility. Um, and the fourth, just coming back to the point on public engagement, I think part of this more expert but also opening up policy making would be to see deliberative methods and public engagement as a core part of the process. Um, finally, uh, um, is uh, a, a sort of another bucket which we, we talk about is wider institutional reform. So most of those first two things have focused on individuals operating it within the system, ministers and officials. Um, but we also think some change is needed to the sort of context they operate within. Um, the first of those is, is sort of stronger coordination from the cabinet office, um, playing a greater role in agreeing the, uh, the government's policy programme, but then also in, in being able to sort of deliver and leverage those cross-cutting policy issues. The second, and I think this is a huge one, is a, a much more long-term treasury. We've argued for changes to the spending review process to encourage a, a focus on long-term performance, among other things. And finally, we've, we've, we've argued for much more resource for evaluation. Um, still, evaluation is pretty patchy. And I think if, if the civil service and government isn't able to look back and understand how well a policy has worked, then that makes it much more difficult to improve. Um, so big set of problems, uh, a sort of uh, a, 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 some suggestions on where to start in terms of solutions. I'll just wrap up by saying I think it's, it's not an easy time to be in government or trying to make policy. Uh, I think the current kind of economic challenges in particular make a lot of the trade-offs much sharper. Um, but there are sort of policy windows that are open, and I think there is an opportunity for um, interesting and, and sort of effective policies to be made if government can grip some of those problems we've been talking about. Great. Plenty there to discuss, I think. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tom. Um, so the way we want to run this today is uh, not as a sort of pure panel discussion with some questions at the end, but much more of an interactive session, questions from the floor. I've already got uh, lots of questions coming in via Slido. If you're watching online, please do send in questions. Um, and we'd like to know not just you know, what you'd like to ask the panel, but also if you have expertise and thoughts that you'd like to feed into this discussion, we really want to hear those thoughts. So please join us now in, in discussing these issues. I'm going to start by kicking off uh, with one question to each mem of the, member of the panel myself, just to get the conversation going. Uh, but then I would love to start uh, talking to everybody in the room and online. Um, Paul, I'm going to start with you, uh, seeing you're uh, coming to us uh, down the line. Clearly, you have experience both in the UK and New Zealand within government, but also now outside government. How does that experience align with the problems that Tom has outlined? and our analysis of the possible solutions we ha have put forward. Do you think that those are the right sort of answers, or should we be being, as, as Tom said earlier, much more radical in some way? Um, 
Thanks very much. And apologies that I'm not there in person, wasn't able to get to, to London today. Um, I think in a nutshell, I wholeheartedly agree with the, with the problem diagnosis. Um, I think I'd quibble with a few bits and pieces, but broadly speaking, I think it's a really excellent summary, a sort of saddening summary in some regards of um, the position we're in. I mean, I think the starting premise that we are or have been uh, as a policy profession better at solving shorter term problems than these big longer term chronic ones is exactly uh, right. And actually, you know, in my sort of darker moments, I reflect on having spent 20 years in the policy profession and, and really sort of feel complicit in what is a long term failure in some of those sort of more chronic areas that um, Tom alluded to. Um, certainly recognise the question about uh, the lack of deep expertise. I say this again, uh, I don't want this to be a therapy session for me, but I say it as one of those people who pinballed around Whitehall a little bit, perhaps not, not entirely, um, uh, but I definitely recognise um, that uh, challenge, certainly recognise the challenge about the narrowness of the Whitehall view and perhaps something I uh, reflect more on now having left Whitehall uh, than I did at the time. Um, and I very much agree on poor cross-government working. So um, again, this is one of those areas where I, it used to slightly irritate me when I was in the policy profession, when people talked a lot about the importance of joined up government um, as a sort of truism. And, um, we, you know, I, I still remember one of the most liberating things the Secretary of State ever said to me was embrace your silo, stop going to cross government working meetings and get on with achieving something. And actually, we, I think we did as a result uh, equally. Uh, it's undoubtedly the case that if you want to solve some of these deeper, more chronic, longer term issues, then they involve multiple departments. And it's part of the our failure to do so, I think, lies in the way in which we do have a more siloed approach than we should across government. And um, I'd actually go a bit further and say, I think there are some issues which are really important, which almost don't have any home in government. So certainly in the social policy sphere, I think we have a, uh, a bias towards services and then for, for understandable reasons. So if, if you work in social policy in Whitehall, you tend to work in public services or public service reform, because obviously, you know, for understandable reasons, you spend billions of pounds every uh, every year on different public services. So you're driven by an agenda around efficiency, productivity outputs, et cetera. Um, whereas actually, you know, stepping back and thinking about the longer term challenges, you tend to think about concepts like, um, you know, family strength or poverty or social capital or relationships, which are the sort of things that uh, send Whitehall civil servants scurrying away thinking, what on earth are they talking about? And nobody leads on that. Um, it's always instructive when you get a parliamentary question come in on something like family strength or social capital. Nobody wants to take it because no department is responsible for it. And yet, when you dig beneath some of these longer term chronic issues that uh, that Tom was alluding to, then these, these are really important areas of uh, policy. So it's not just joined up government, it's actually, um, you know, some of these things don't have a home at all. But, uh, but overall, basically, I agree with the diagnosis. I definitely don't agree with the point about the centre of the government being too weak, uh, but no doubt we can sort of come back to that. Um, on the solutions, um, a bit more mixed. I suspect other panellists will be the same, but I say that not necessarily being able to offer up brilliant solutions to these. Maybe if I felt I had the solutions, I'd still be in Whitehall trying to implement them. Um, four that I particularly do agree with, so the career anchors point, I think, is a, is a good one. Um, I actually think more of that probably goes on already than the report implies. Um, a lot of people do tend to gravitate towards particular sort of policy families, even if they don't stay in a very narrow bit. And of course, it shouldn't just be about moving within a smaller range of Whitehall jobs. It's about moving in and out of Whitehall. So, you know, if you're a DHSC official, you know, it's great if you can go and spend some time in the NHS. I also think it's quite important to have officials moving in and out of the very centre. So Treasury would be a better place, in my view, if it was populated by more policy officials who'd worked outside of the Treasury in, in different um, areas. Uh, very much agree with the mixed teams argument, and I think that is a better way of pitching it than, uh, uh, and this is where I did sort of, there's a slightly sneery comment in the report about the outdated model of the generalist. I don't think the generalist model is outdated, and I think trying to create a hierarchy between generalists and specialists is, is you know, pointless. The reality is generalists serve a purpose, specialists serve a purpose, and mixed teams that combine different skills together is, is I think, where you get your, your best policy outputs. Uh, more transparency, yes. Before I went to New Zealand, I'd probably have said no, thank you. Having experience, experienced in uh, New Zealand, I can see the benefits of it. Very happy to talk a bit more about that. Uh, more deliberative methods, big yes. 
Um, really nice to see the reference to Polly McKenzie's great um, uh, report, The Humble Policymaker, in which he talks about deliberative methods. You know, reflecting on this report, I think, you know, I spent 20 years in the Whitehall policy profession, ended up in quite a senior role. Nobody at any point asked me whether I had any skills around participative and deliberative methods. I don't, as it happens, um, but I think uh, we need much more of that in the uh, in the policy making process. I think the big uh, big area where I'm just not sure about the sort of bucket of um, solutions is around accountability. And I think that's partly because I think one thing the report slightly skips around is what do we mean by good policy making and what what are expertise in policy making? And ultimately, despite the nod towards Polly Polly's work and a sort of passing reference in the introduction to it's not all technical skills, is it? Actually, I think the report defaults to a technocratic view of what policy making is, as though there is a right and a wrong. And that then pushes you down an accountability. If only we had the right accountability, then people would do the right things. And actually, policy is just messier than that. And that's not an argument for not having standards. Um, and I, I was a head of a policy profession uh, within a department, and we focused very hard on standards. We had a set of policy tests, um, one of which was indeed, what is the point of this policy, which I, I do think is often undercooked. And um, so I'm not, I would never argue against standards, but I think one of the risks at the moment is the desire for policy making to be professionalized is reaching for a quite technocratic view of what policy making is. And I'm not sure that is what the policy profession is most missing. We can always get better at that. I, I would never advocate getting rid of the what work centers, but you can have as many what work centers as you want um, and uh, not necessarily solve these longer term, deeper underlying issues. And therefore, I just I cannot see how a single person accountable for the quality or rigor of policy advice in a department would quite work, um, partly because I think everybody has to be responsible for that. But but it, I'd almost say rather than rather than trying to undo the blurring of accountability, we actually need the civil service and ministers working in in a blurry partnership, actually, with civil servants feeling more comfortable operating in what is actually a political environment because that is what policy making is about. It is not a meeting a set of sort of legal finance, accountancy standards, statistical standards in the way that other professions operate. The policy profession is, you know, a bit a bit different. So so I, I have my doubts about the accountability side. That's great. A lot there. Thank you very much, Paul. And particularly interested in those thoughts around how we think about what policy making is and what that means for accountability. Tom, I'm going to give you a chance to come back on all this once everyone else has had a chance to, to, to put forward some initial views. Rachel, can I come to you next? You clearly also have had the perspective from inside government and now um, uh, as part of Public First, thinking about how, how the public think about policy issues. What's your view about what's going wrong and how we might address the key problems? So. Um I'll come to the kind of substance of what uh, Tom and Paul talked about in a minute. I suppose before then, it is probably worth reiterating why this conversation matters. Because on days like today, um, what, what one tends to get, at least in my world, which is maybe slightly more political than others in the room, is a version of the kind of good chaps theory of government, which is broadly, if only there were competent, sensible people in charge, bracket, who agree with what I think, um, then things would be better. And there is an extent to which that is true. And there are better cabinet ministers and worse cabinet ministers and better policy officials and worse policy officials. Um, but even if the different people in this room were to draw up their fantasy cabinet, um, I think many of the underlying problems that I think Lord Sainsbury articulated brilliantly in his speech this morning and that you talked about remain. Um, and I, I also agree with a huge number of the things that have been laid out. I, I think I will focus on two, one of which you've discussed and one of which you haven't. Um, the one which I think we haven't discussed today is scale, size. And it, it's always striking to me that in, when you reach for case studies and you talk about what you're copying uh, in other countries, these other countries or places tend to be quite small and they often are quite homogenous. It's New Zealand or Finland or Singapore or maybe New York, if you're really stretching the, the diversity. Um, 
And there's a reason for that. I think that many, some of the criticisms we make about joined up government and coordination and delivery are because we have a central state that is simply too big to achieve many of the things we, we want to achieve. And I have become very persuaded, not that it's a panacea, but that until we devolve quite a lot of the things that we currently put under central government, it's going to be very, very hard to get not only the kind of level of innovation and change that we want, um, but also the level of coordination and interaction with the public and civic uh, society that is part of what you're identifying, and, and which would then, I think, allow some of the functions that you're talking about in central government to actually succeed. So I think that that is a necessary but not sufficient condition to really changing things. I also think, and this follows the conversation we were having all the same three, that um, these are deep-seated, um, not only incentives, but cultures about how things are done. And until you start to change where they're done and the sorts of people you're bringing in, I'm, I'm unconvinced that many of these mechanisms uh, will work. So I think that, that's the first really important thing that I would add uh, to this debate. Um, the second thing, uh, sorry, I'll add two more things. The, the thing that seems to me easiest to change and uh, certainly echoes my experience is the introduction and maintenance of more expertise in government departments. So both bringing more people who already know something about a subject and then uh, changing the incentives to keep them. You know, I was very conscious when I was in Downing Street that there were brilliant people in the policy unit, in the center of government, you could not have a more um, important role in many ways, who felt they had to leave after a couple of years or they were never going to get promoted. And that's, that's crazy. And equally, while you may want some generalists, I'm not sure it was healthy that my connections with the education system at large was greater than most of the senior civil servants that I was dealing with because they were just new. I, I don't think that's healthy. So I think, I think that is changeable and needs to be a changed. I think this one that is much harder to change, but was also very noticeable to me, is the orientation to um, both who you are serving and the general public, and they are different. And to give an example of this, you know, I was always very conscious when I was in um, working in education, uh, in government and before when I was working on it outside, that the entire um, communications function into and out of the DfE came from the sector. So let's take uh, schools, for example. It would come from teachers and people who represented teachers and heads and those who represented heads. And there was very little feedback loop that drove you to think about either what the public's interest was in terms of education or what the parents' and children's interests were because the structure simply went there. It's not how communications thought. It wasn't how announcements went out. When you went and did your conferences, it's not who you talked to. It's not where your noise came back from. And this, um, and I think this was deeply problematic. And I'm a defender of focus groups and polling, and I think the more the better, because at least it forces you to recognize what people care about. Um, but I do think more structures that force you to constantly recognize that matter. Deliberative, um, deliberative methods have some role to play in that. I'm actually quite interested in whether we could go a bit further and have more jury style methods mm. in government. Because I think one of the problems with deliberative methods is they turn people into a quarter experts and then you're either convinced that that's how the public will behave, which it isn't because they're not quarter experts, or you haven't actually given them any decision making power. So I think they're sort of halfway house often. Mm. Um, but I think that really uh, is central. Again, would be much easier to create long term if more of the things we did were on a smaller scale. So I'm sorry, Tom, I've introduced another thing to an already massive uh, <laughs> list. But I do think it's the possibly the most important thing to do before you solve those things. Very interesting, and gives me a good lead in to talk to Andrew and to say, obviously, Rachel has raised the question of devolution, doing things at a different scale, what difference that makes. She's argued um, helps with innovation, helps with uh, coordination. Mm. What's your view? Is is policy making, is UK government policy making sufficiently good at uh, taking the, the local view? So the short answer is no. Um, the long answer is no, and then re <laughs> repeat, repeated on, on many occasions. 
But to, to think of it from a, I know I think about these issues and engage with these issues from a local growth perspective, primarily. And I think there is something interesting around the relationship between the value of local expertise and insight and the centralised nature of the system that we've got. And those two things play off against each other and they drive a set of um, behaviours and I think they increase the significance of the outcomes of those behaviours, I think, which is important for us to kind of uh, think through. But uh, basically, um, if you think about central government's relationship to local government, it doesn't trust local government, really. That's a general statement. There'll be some variations and nuances. But in general, it doesn't uh, trust it. And the reason why is several reasons. One, because we are very centralised, there is a culture in a sense of that the best is at the centre and everything else is second best. If you're serious about policy making and public service, you do that in central government and that transcends through into local government being something else for those that didn't um, quite make it. So there's a sense that local government is not as good as, at least as, as central government, within central government. The second thing is central government really doesn't have hardly any knowledge and certainly not good knowledge about local government and local areas. Really doesn't spend much time trying to figure that out. It's not really interested in part, which is why it doesn't try to figure that out. And some of the mechanisms that we did have, Audit Commission being an example, were actively dismantled uh, during previous phases of uh, policy and government. And so it sort of further retarded the ability of, local, of central government to really understand local government and um, uh, what is going on in different localities. And then thirdly, I think the centralised nature and the role of central government in, our, in my field, I don't know in other fields, in my field has created a kind of slightly strange and somewhat bizarre game where in order to win the game, if you're local government, i.e. to get more money, you have to, you have to actively embellish and overclaim on what localities are and what they could do. Everybody knows that this is the game, but everybody has to play it, central government and local government. And if you think about information and knowledge and expertise, in part residing on some facts and some reality, that is made more problematic in this kind of very strange game that we've established through competitive bidding and all of those kinds of things. And then my fourth point would be, and my first point would be, as a result of those sorts of things, and this is where we need to be honest, Local government quality, capability, the ability to marshal local resources and gather insights and expertise from whoever it is in locality is less than it should be or could be because of the nature of local government in a very centralised system. So capacity and resources are not there at local government level. Unsurprisingly, we don't have the capability and the expertise sometimes to perform the roles and so it's a self-fulfilling cycle which is why, from, at least from our point of view, we're interested in and are committed to a program of devolution because in a sense that becomes a means to an end rather than an end in itself. And actually one of the means you're trying to drive through devolution is actually to build capacity and capability at the local level to be better policy makers. So I think you kind of have to think those sorts of things through. But if we don't really accept and recognize the centralized nature of the system, then tinkering at the lo locality level will be largely irrelevant and probably not very productive. I think that's a really interesting point about the, 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 the game that people are playing, essentially. And I think the same applies with devolution at large, doesn't it? You know, everybody says it's a good idea. And then they Until. don't actually uh, yeah. walk the talk, as it were. Um, Anna, you spent a lot of time talking to ministers, officials, in the course of your work. What's your sense, from your perspective, of, of why some policies work and others don't? Um, I, should, I should declare that I feel personally attacked, because actually my first job was working on the Green Deal with uh, the Department <laughs> of Energy and Climate Change. So I feel like we've, everyone on the we've panel. started with, you know, <laughs> very, very <laughs> profound failure. Um, so I sort of had the, the weird perspective of someone that was sort of working for a spin-off uh, and a department and then became a journalist. Um, my experience, it, it varies because not all ministers are the same, not all officials are the same. Something that, that I, I think the report sort of gets at and, and your speech, Lord Sainsbury, sort of gets at is actually a reverse ageism. There's, there's this desire for bright young things 
um, that is very natural um, and is useful and is important because actually most most of the time when you're trying to have a long-term view with policy, you're thinking about the next generation. So it's very natural to want to get young people involved with that. It's very natural to be impressed by fresh eyes on old problems. But um, what, what I do find is that um, you, you know, when, I, when I've been sort of looking, at, looking around the, the underbelly of LinkedIn to try and find out who might be interesting to talk to, is that um, <laughs> the most expert people are often the people with the plainest CVs that seem to have been somewhat overlooked in a corner. And I had someone that... Um, Quite recently, they, they didn't give me a scoop, so it's probably fine. Um, uh, uh, and they were a complete expert on a very, very niche area of, of, of policy. Um, they were um, in, in their 60s, and actually they were the only person that knew what they knew, and it was actually a very important function of government. Um, and this happens a lot within broader areas of things like contingency planning, so actually some of the most sensitive areas of, of government that are also absolutely um, <laughs> reliant on relationships with local government. And um, someone thought it would be great to make him a leaving gift. Sorry, there's rambling, but there's a point. Um, a leaving gift, and they, they, they took basically everything this person knew. It was on about six or seven sheets of A3. It was completely essential information, but they thought, oh, do you know what, I'll get it inscribed on a leaving gift. <laughs> Two months later, they're like, could we have your leaving gift? <laughs> There's actually some really useful information on it, and you took your papers away with you. Um, uh, so it's sort of, um, and I won't, I won't say what's on it, but it was, it was fairly important to the functioning of state. Um, but but people, people didn't always rate this person because they had sat in the same chair for a long time, and they were of an older generation. And they would sort of just really keep a very close eye on their functioning government. They were very productive because they kept informing other areas of policy. But that value add wasn't necessarily seen as, as what is valued, which is, you know, when I talk to ministers, officials, they're like, oh, yeah, they're only, they're only 30, but they delivered that incredibly awful IT project, and we never deliver IT projects on time. Um, and, then I, and then I speak to that official by the time they hit 35, and they're really burnt out because they got known as a person that delivers. And so they just have to deliver. But actually, the reason they got that first IT project delivered first was because they were really passionate about that. Um, that particular project, and they'd engaged with stakeholders, and they probably knew it inside out. Um, so there's, there, is, there is this fixation on youth as opposed to um, the range of perspectives you might have in a room. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm, I think this report hits on, hits on a lot of this, this tension that we've, we've heard from around the room about local versus central, and, and with the obsession with the red wall, blue wall, any colour you like wall. Um, um, has, has become this, nation, na this notion of how do you deliver at a local level because actually that's how you win elections as well as achieving every other um, objective you might have, call it levelling up, call it the productivity crisis, however you choose to brand it. You know, the industrial strategy was about levelling up, but we, we ran it all the time. Um, and it's this idea of, you know, how much should be central, how much should be local. Um, but the problem is when, when, when your promotion is determined as a minister or as an official, where it's delivering for your minister, your, 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 sort of your, your praise structure is entirely centralised. That's how you know you've done well a lot of the time, the obsession with the, the value that's given to working in number 10 or the cabinet office does mean that your, your promotion or your incentive structure is around um, um, delivering for your minister and often those deli uh, deliverables are rated more highly if they're centralised. I think some of the mayoralties have changed that dynamic um, and a lot of ministers are very paranoid about, you know, what the, what the Ben Houchins of this world think about any given policy. And I think that has slightly changed that, um, at least their sense of how it should be developed. Um, but, yeah, the, the, the reverse ageism, I would say, if I had to pick a problem, is actually that. Because that's the real tension between generalist and expert. So you either have people like the individual I described who stay in role, and they're just like, I know this is really important. I'll never get promoted, but I know it's really important and I'm really good at it. Um, or when I'm actually trying to find experts on something, I normally go to the first person, the, the best, pay, best paid ex-civil servant I can find in a particular area. <laughs> because while their expertise weren't valued by, um, by, by Whitehall, perhaps as they felt they ought to be, or they felt they were going, they had to switch jobs, change specialties in order to get promotion. Um, there's like someone offered to pay me four times as much to do what I'm really good at and I really enjoy. Um, and I think that's something the, the report touches on. Um, and I just have to say, 
it's page 32 before we get to more central management as being the solution. So for me, it's like absolute coup of an IFG report. So, <laughs> so, so thanks for that. But yeah, I think, I think if above anything else, um, um, it's the reverge ageism. I, I think the notion of juries is very interesting. There's something that the OECD are looking at a lot for net zero. I'll stop rambling in a sec because I think we're going to come around the room again. But um, um, net zero is an example where this jury model, I think, is, re is really taking off. Weirdly, it's budgetary officials that want to make that work because they're like, we're having to allocate so, so much money. But it's like, it's so, so, so much money over such a long period of time. And net zero is kind of changing this dynamic. And so I do think it is an area where we will, where we will see that difference, but also hopefully some better intergenerational working where people like me who are already starting to get a bit old for Whitehall, who worked on things like the Green Deal, can say, well, this is what we got wrong last time. <laughs> um, yeah, but um, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a great report, and I, I, hope, I hope some of it's adopted. But let, let's not have a go at the 24-year-olds. Let's maybe think about how we value the people that are in their 60s, 70s, and increasingly older than that in the workplace, potentially, going forward. Very good. Good of you to highlight your, your one main thing. I think, given the questions, we're boggling people with the extent of the problem here. So, Tom, I'm going to ask you to respond to any of that, with a particular focus, I think, on, on how the solutions operate for the, for the problems that we've been talking about. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm really enjoying this gentle teasing of IFG as well. I <laughs> uh, just feel proud that I got to a report without recommending an OBR for anything. So, uh, um, But just on, on Rachel's scale point, I mean, I think that is really critical here and actually it cuts across many of the problems that we're talking about and I do agree that actually you know you can think about what more responsive policy that involves the public more much that involves the public more much more easily when you look down at some of those uh, local areas making policy and think about that um, I think actually my former professor Tony Travers at the back made a really interesting point about scale in the morning session so he might want to come in on that um, just a couple of points one on um, generalists. Um, Paul, I agree definitely that generalists are still needed. Um, I think what, what the bit that we think is outdated is the sort of dominance of generalists to the exclusion of, of specialists. Um, but I agree with you that, that those kind of mixed teams are needed and you do still need some of that, that generalist skill. Um, I think on the public engagement and the focus and, and, and Rachel's points there, um, I totally agree that this shouldn't be about kind of replicating hundreds of citizens' assemblies. I think those can be a useful mechanism, but I think your point about a quarter experts is right. I think where we should be looking is actually there's a kind of huge spread of public engagement mechanisms and tools. A lot of digital methods actually that are really interesting for thinking about how people could be brought in much more easily. Um, I wasn't trying to be rude about focus groups and polling. <laughs> um, but I think seeing it as a kind of spectrum of tools at the policymaker's disposal and your, your framing of reorienting the sort of the focus so that you feel much more that the public are a, a key part of it, I think is absolutely um, right. And I think I had a fourth. My fourth was just, I think, Paul's point about potentially going down the too technocratic route is a really, really interesting challenge. Um, I think the policy profession is very different to the other professions in government. And clearly, you can't just kind of copy and paste from the way that kind of digital or finance or HR has professionalized himself. Uh, I think there's an interesting tension then between creating a set of standards that, to some extent, kind of write down and codify what the expectations around policy are, but at the same time, retaining the kind of space for creative uh, innovative policy and, and interesting discussions between ministers and officials. Uh, I think that's a really useful point and, and an area for us to explore. Thanks, Tom. Um, I'm going to come to some questions in the room now. If that's all right. The microphone is going to come to you. This gentleman here, I think, um, Penny, actually the one further along. Thank you. If you don't also, mind. Also, if you guys have your phones on and there have been any more resignations, <laughs> Rachel's that's feeling great. really I'm worried. Feeling that <laughs> <laughs> she it's been half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us who you are um, and uh, what your question is? Thank you. Yeah, uh, Simon Kay. I'm the uh, policy director at the think tank Reform. I have to say think tank Reform these days, or people think it's a different reform. Uh, and I wanted to start by saying that I think it's a really strong paper. I think your list of problems is a really good one. We're doing a lot of uh, thinking and research in exactly this area right now at Reform. And it's so helpful and so nourishing to be in, in this conversation too. So thank you so much. Um, 
I wanted to reinforce the points that have been made about devolution and decentralization, which is probably quite predictable given my own background, uh, and before Professor Travers closes the book on it, uh, as it were. Uh, it seems to me that there's a, a very clear through line from decentralization to a kind of reducing complexity of policy problems that then helps to solve knowledge problems in the way that you kind of pick up in your paper. Um, one of the huge challenges that I think policymakers face is that the whole system has so much inertia to it and so many different layers and variables playing out that it's difficult to get enough grasp to make meaningful interventions in policy terms. Actually decentralizing in a meaningful way or devolving functionality isn't just a way of reducing Whitehall parochialism, as you put it, but could also be a key ingredient to addressing all kinds of the other issues that you that you pick up here in this paper. So I, it, I think it'd be really interesting to, to try and explore that. And just relatedly and very quickly, I think there's a connection as well between that decentralization devolution point, this scale issue, and the question about uh, generalists and specialists. So I think we tend to slip and slide and have kind of uh, quite, quite broad definitions of what we mean by generalism and specialism. And when we talk about civil service or policymaker generalism, I think we tend to mean that people have moved around a lot and therefore have a little bit of understanding about a lot of different policy areas. But there's another way of thinking about generalism, which is also about the generalist ability to think critically about policy making itself, no matter what policy area you're addressing, the baseline skills and understandings that are going to be relevant in almost any department. Now, I've been doing some stuff recently for the policy profession unit, uh, which has been really interesting. And uh, what's interesting about that is that I think there's, there's a lot of demand among people who define themselves as policy professionals for that underlying sort of substratum of skills of understanding what it means to make trade-offs and to think about alternative approaches in a way that's sort of economically intelligent and tech factors in opportunity costs, thinking about unintended consequences for policy and thinking in a very nuanced way about risk, which I know has come up quite a lot so far today. These are all things that I would describe as general or generalist policy skills that I think are worth addressing. And more broadly, if we're talking about breaking down silos and achieving more effective policy, Operating at smaller scales allows us to do that too, because actually you're talking about relevant, specific, actionable contexts where implementation and policy design coincide with each other. The other thing I've been learning recently in my own work is just how few feedback loops exist within the policy making system. In other words, there are very few learning opportunities for people who work, and it's not just a question of being long-term placed. There are very few opportunities to build in and to, to, to iterate and to learn from how things happened when implemented at local scales, and to take that back to the people who then originate and design the next policy or, or, or iterate it into its next form. So that's quite a lot, isn't it? But I'll pass it on. Very interesting. Thank you much, very much. And seeing you've started us on a devolution track, I'm going to uh, offer the microphone to Tony Travers, who may have something to say on the same issue. OK, well, thank you. Uh, I'm Tony Travers from the LSE. Um, so I, I will build on this idea of more local decision making, which has just been referred to, and Andrew's referred to it. Um, but by, by just start by saying that one of the things, and we can't get rid of the adversarial political system that we all love with its majoritarian way of doing things, but there is no doubt that that structure, I, I would argue, creates a very big pressure on parties every time there's a general election to say, the school system has failed. The health system has failed. The welfare system is failing. The transport system is failing. And that immediately puts you into a position of having to pass new laws and create new structures, because the structures are often seen as a proxy for outcomes. And that is a powerful dynamic affecting, and we, you know, we are where we are, as the man used to say. But um, it, I think it is worth noting that at the local level, just, just, there is a segue here. And by the way, there are parts of policy which are not like that. Generally, foreign policy, defense policy, science policy, infrastructure, better handled sort of ethics issues in the sort of medical version of them, much better handled. Um, but at the local level, you know, to use a cliche, there, there aren't really left and right wing ways of emptying bins. You can do it a bit more or a bit less. You can contract it out or do it in-house. But in the end, either the streets are clean or they are not. So when you look at the way local 
manifestos are written. They're much less about the previous administration completely failed and we're going to do everything totally differently. They're about, we'll do a bit more here, a bit less of that there. Evidence for this, there's no politics in social housing at the local level. Conservatives, Labour, Liberal Democrat politicians all want more social housing. It's not, but at the national level, it's a matter of high politics and we're going to be trying to sell off this or whatever it is. So, so I think my point is just to reinforce this idea that whilst we can't escape the adversarial political world of which we are a part, if more policy were, were as it were, devised and implemented much nearer to where people live, it would be much less volatile, Very interesting. I would argue. Andrew, do you want to come back and either no, of those? I would, no, I, I agree with both um, comments. So I think then, as we start to move towards how we might think about more devolution in that sense, I think in order to get more devolution, and because it rubs up against this first point that I made, which is central government, when push comes to shove, really doesn't think the local government is up to it. And all, all governments or all oppositions prior to coming into government for the last 20 or so years have been massively in favour of devolution and decentralisation until they're into government and then they become less so, although some notable exceptions. So I think if we are then to advocate and push forward on this agenda, I think being very clear about and tactical about building on experiences and examples where we can point to things that seem to have been getting better or things done differently and actually saying, look, it's happening here, it could happen here, or it's happening here, wouldn't it be good if we had more of that? And we see this with our mayors as a, kind of, as a possibility. But it also requires us, in my view at least, to be more incremental and opportunistic about the way that we proceed. And that's why we are against these kind of comprehensive plans for rolling out devolution at wide scale, all at the same time to everywhere else. Because ultimately, I think the system kicks back and stops those things happening. So I'm massively in favour of being incremental, deliberately so, being patchy, asymmetric, use whatever words that you want, because ultimately I think that's the way that we get through the system as it currently is, and I don't fully understand how the system as it currently is radically changes, uh, you know, wholesale all at once to be a kind of massively less centralised system. Yes, the evidence is it doesn't. Does anyone yeah. else want to come in on this point before I move to... Uh, topic which is coming up a lot in the online questions. Um, I'm going to read out the one from Katriona Lang, which says, deep expertise is good, but most long-term challenges are complex and cut across themes. So we need the ability to see across boundaries and join up. Ideally, we need people with a deep career anchor, which is what we've been discussing, but also experience across disciplines and departments. So how do you combine those two things? So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a defender of the specialist. Uh, for a minute. I, I think there are two kinds of, to, to follow your point, there are, there are two kinds of specialisms that we tend to talk about. There is being an economist or a data scientist or an engineer, someone who is um, specialist in a function and in a way of addressing problems and looking at numbers that you can transfer to an extent across disciplines. And then there's knowing about education or welfare or health. Um, and I think it is true you need some of both. Um, although I think even if you are an economist, you are probably a better economist in education if you know the literature in education. So, I mean, there is a degree to which a degree of knowledge matters even if you have generalist skills. I think it is certainly the case that one can um, specialise in more than one thing over a 60 or maybe 50 year career. Um, but possibly trying to specialise in 25 is a bit much. In other words, this is, not, this is not going to be perfect, but it seems to me that we have pushed too far in one direction. Um, and that, you know, one of the things I've, I've found slightly amusing um, is that in education, we have put huge amounts of effort, with limited success, it must be said, to make uh, knowledge a bigger part of the education system because there's enough now cognitive science and evidence that suggests that domain-specific knowledge really matters in how you get educated. And you can't create, you can't be skilled if you don't know anything, while uh, explicitly going the other way in how we manage the education department. This seems to me <laughs> overdone. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, I think you were nodding there. Do you want to, do you want to come in? Uh, yeah, um, so 
I mean, I think I agree with the spirit of the question, really. So I, I very much agree with what Tom was saying about the, you know, what is what do we mean by a generalist? And I think a generalist is it's not so much about generic knowledge or very sort of thin general knowledge across different policy areas. It's it it is a, a being a generalist policy. Um, Maker, I think it's, it's sometimes equated like, a bit like having an MBA. So you will know a bit about data science and behavioral insights, and you should probably have a decent literacy around economics. And you know there is a set of things you do, and actually to some degree the policy profession is set up in this way that you become a more intelligent consumer of uh, other specialisms, the sort of functional specialisms to some degree that Rachel was just um, talking about. I do agree, though, with the question that if we think about what skills you need depends what question you're trying to answer. So it all comes back to, well, as I say, it was always our policy test number one is what is the point? What are you actually trying to achieve here? And sometimes what is what we're trying to achieve in policy is something quite narrow where technical skills and expertise um, or deep sector knowledge would be absolutely essential and a priority. Sometimes you're trying to actually engage in a messier and frankly more political process. So, um, so a good example for me is like, you know, our failure to come to a long term settlement around social care. Um, you know, I. I was part of one of the failed attempts in this area where I was asked to come into the cabinet office when Theresa May was there, um, assemble a team of the brightest and best across Whitehall and solve social care. And daftly, I said, yes, I'll come and do that. So I assembled a group of people who knew a hell of a lot about the social care sector, far more than I did. I sort of like, I am the generalist, I need my deep uh, knowledge. And of course, some of the people who then came into the team had been through multiple attempts at this under different governments and had a lot of knowledge, not just of the of the subject matter, but of, of the sort of failed attempts as well. But what I was then sort of asked to do was come up with a technically correct answer to this question, usually with a kind of surely private insurance can solve this. I know everybody's tried and nobody's found it, but can we just have another go? Um, but actually, so it, so it was sort of set up as a sort of technical and more specialist, you know, how do we solve this? Well, of course, the only approach which is ever going to get somewhere on, on a long term settlement around social care and social care funding is one which is more deliberative, actually, whatever that looks like, and gets out there and tries to solve it with a broader range of people. It's not going to be a bunch of experts at the centre. Um, and, you know, needless to say, it was another failed attempt. Um, so, so there's something about starting with what is the the actual question we're trying to solve here, rather than assuming, yes, it needs to be generalist led or yes, it needs to be specialist led, you assemble the team and you use the tools and techniques needed to, to solve that problem. But we're really poor, I think, at working out what is the problem we're trying to solve right at the beginning. Sometimes we think we have, but we just don't spend very much time defining what success is for a particular piece of policy work. And you need to know what success would look like in order to know what the team is that you need to pull together. There's a question that's coming from John Preston saying, uh, good policy and service delivery is inherently cross-functional. Do we need to break down functional silos and create small cross-disciplinary teams with analysts, policy designers, operational staff, etc., which is one of the things we talk about in the report. Tom, I just wondered if you could give us some examples of good practice on that. You, you spoke in your, in your opening remarks about some departments are getting better at putting the right teams together to solve policy problems. Do, do we have examples of good practice on that? I mean, I think that's definitely right. And I think we call for um, this idea of kind of multidisciplinary, multi-specialism sort of teams. And I think Paul's point about actually recognising what types of skills you need at the start of a policy process um, is, is, is really the right one. I mean, if you look back, I, I mentioned the example of the Rough Sleepers unit um, in my opening bit. And that was a really interesting team in the, in the sort of late 90s, early 2000s, because it brought in people from outside. You had specialists who really understood the sector, who understood local government, who understood the kind of complex set of problems a person faces in that situation, along with you know, experienced civil servants who understood the system and how to get the different parts of the system to work in their favor, along with Louise Casey, who was a kind of powerful um, advocate and had the backing of the prime minister. Um, and what's interesting about that is that team was able to kind of leverage three or four big departments which don't traditionally work together particularly well to move in a direction and actually, you know, the, the progress in terms of reducing rough sleeping numbers over that period was really impressive. Um, I think that's quite unusual in terms of actually assembling a team like that in that fashion. And I think you've got different constraints on 
officials when they're trying to do that. So one might be that, you know, actually you're just under huge time pressure and you cannot find the person with the sufficient expertise in the, in the policy area you're talking about. That's some of the experience that, that David's had and also a lot of actual ministers that we interview for our Ministers Reflect series. Um, I think the other thing is you have other processes which are less a kind of defined policy reform and more one of those sort of ongoing sort of back burner type issues. And again, there you see problems of, I think we're coming back to the, the, the specialism which we feel is really missing is that policy expertise. So it's that kind of, uh, just briefly on, on sort of the two points made by Rachel and Anna about the kind of career. I think the point that you can't really have a generalist career across 25 areas, or well, that doesn't make sense. I think that's a really interesting one in the sense that you can have policy specialists who might do three or four or five areas really well, and you might plan your career and try and plan Whitehall careers to more effectively move around those areas. And I just wanted to come back to Anna's point about the, the sort of different stages of career, because I think that is a really interesting reflection. Um, often you do find these people sort of hidden away in these slightly dusty corners of Whitehall who really have captured the expertise. Um, the accusation that those people get is that they're also kind of captured by the sector or to, to come back to Paul's example, they're sort of too wedded to a past solution or carrying too much baggage. <laughs> and that's often why they don't get in front of ministers so much. Um, so I think the, the thing there is to say policy specialists need to be able to be promoted and valued and retained and not seen as kind of, you know, not just allowed to gather, gather dust in the corner. Um, and that might mean creating a different type of career path to the, for those people than the career path that we have for the more generalist type. I think that's really interesting. I think the really interesting thing is this is not unacknowledged, right? This is something that repeatedly governments have said, this is something we want to do, we want to reward expertise and so on, but it just doesn't happen. Um, sorry, Rachel, you want to No, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm slightly dwelling on what Paul's been talking about. I hope it's okay, <laughs> but I, I, am, I think there is a bit of a risk of this conversation that we, um, we make the best the enemy of a, the good a little bit. That if we take two different policy problems, um, so let's take technical education, which the RFJ has done a lot of work on, and where there have been reports, including Lord Sainsbury's, which have got quite a lot of consensus about what has been done, but implementation has been quite poor. That seems to me a, a very good area where delivering some of the things you're talking about would dramatically improve long-term policymaking, as potentially with localism. I'm not sure I would put social care in that category. There are a small number of very entrenched problems that win and lose elections that are fundamentally about public consent and incredibly painful trade-offs. They are not about technical policy making. And I'm just not, I don't want the fact that those small number of very important issues exist and none of us have figured how the hell to build more houses, to distract that there are an awful lot of other policy challenges which seem to be wholly amenable to this approach. Mm. Um, so I, I do think we need to split them slightly. Yeah, I think that's a very good, good point. Are there any more questions in the room? Can I just come in on that point? Yeah, sorry. I threw it back to you, Paul. Let, you should come let, back. Let me, let me let Paul... Yeah. No, Paul. So, 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 so I, I very much agree with that. And this is, this is why I have a bit of a problem with the accountability section of the report. Because I think what Rachel just articulated really well there is policy. What we mean by policy is very, very different in different areas. Sometimes it's quite technical. Sometimes it is about you know, can we build a new public consensus around a really big, complicated issue? It's actually the latter that I think we are generally worst at. I think that's why we've got these big long-term problems. I don't think it's a set of technical skills to fix it. I think deliberative methods might help. I think, you know, even slightly sort of nebulous concepts and skills like creativity and imagination wouldn't go amiss. You won't find anything about that in the policy curriculum, that's for sure. These are the sorts of areas where I think if you if you want to connect the opening bit of the report about the long-term chronic challenges we're failing to address with policy solutions, swinging into a technocratic view of uh, policy making with stronger accountability is not going to get you there. It might well fix some of the other problems, some of the more technical policy issues, but it's not going to not going to get you very far. I don't think on these these bigger, broader questions where there's a whole different set of skills which need to be about bringing civil servants and ministers together, actually, and, and just embracing the blurriness of that accountability rather than sort of separating it out, in my view. I definitely want to come back to this accountability question, but I'm going to go to the gentleman behind it, and then I'll come to the lady. So I'm Shadab Ahmed, uh, working in the Open Innovation team. Um, 
this is a bit of a narrower focus of the report. So the Open Innovation Team works across government. We're a bunch of civil servants who try to bring academia and other forms of external expertise into policy making. So we work across health, defense, civil service reform, et cetera. And we see these issues sort of day in, day out of why, why is it so difficult to bring in that external expertise into government. And I think a lot of the issues highlighted in the report sort of speak to that, this short-termism, that we have these two islands of academia, let's say, and policy making, uh, two different languages, completely different languages, lots of jargon in each area. The environment's completely different. You have short-termism short -termism in policy making versus these longer term, uh, sort of the research life cycle is much longer. You have three, five, 10 year funding cycles versus HMTs, as uh, Tom was saying, uh, much narrower, shorter term focus. Um, the priorities are different. We're looking in uh, academia, you know, is my research robust? Is it academically rigorous? Is that gonna get peer reviewed well? Versus policy makers thinking, so what? What's the upshot? What can we take from that research and apply in policy? And these two islands are quite far apart, which is why we need teams like us to be a bridge, be a translator. Um, so my sort of question is, where do we think we need to sort of aim our ambitions and pull our resources? Is it bringing those islands together? And if so, is it bringing academia closer to government and policy making? Or is it actually changing the way government and policy making has worked to bring it closer? Uh, to academia, is it a bit of both, just to sort of lower that threshold um, to be able to be a bridge or to be that translator between them because it's bringing those two worlds uh, together. And of course, we have this idea in the report about having someone responsible in each department for making that link rather than a central government department, but, but doing that within each, each department, <clears throat> which I'd be interested in your view on. But I'm going to come to Una for a question. Nope. <laughs> um, well, I was going to make a different point, if I may, but can I just say that I wholeheartedly support um, uh, my colleague here has just spoken about the need for much closer working between universities and, and government. Uh, since I left the Department of Health in 2016, I've served on the Council of the University of Birmingham and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And the capacity and capability that exists in just those institutions to contribute to thinking about policy making, either at the creative end or the evaluation end, is immense. And we're not really, as a society, making enough of that at all. And that's a, a call out to the universities as much as it is to government. But mindful um, of the fact that we've made the occasional reference to politics here today, I know we've, we've sort of skimmed around it, um, and thinking about where we are in the life cycle of the government, I just wanted to also introduce the idea of um, manifestos. And having been a civil servant for 27 years, the manifestos do figure very significantly in the life of a government department. Obviously, it depends on which department, but in the health department, you know, it's pretty much everything. In fact, the whole department almost gets geared round um, the manifesto of the incoming government. And then you find yourself a few years in with the uh, change of Secretary of State who doesn't necessarily agree with what was in the manifesto and then wants to do something else. Try to have to wait for the next Secretary yeah. of State. That yeah, <laughs> so I, I think I'm just interested in, 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 a, in addition to what I think is an outstanding report from the IFG and so much rich territory for, for change and for further investigation. But I just want to try and understand how we collectively can have a, uh, an increasingly constructive dialogue with aspirational politicians who come into politics for wanting to change things, improve society, for the most part they do, and how can we gain deeper understanding amongst the political class on how things get done and promote better policy making in those domains as well? Thank you. And uh, just to add in uh, an, an anonymous question we've had online, which picks up on exactly the same point, the tension between ministers setting policies and then policymakers developing them, despite those policies sometimes lacking evidence or rationale. Um, so there's two questions there, one about the links between government, academia, and, how, and, and who should be moving. I mean, I think we at the IFG have done work on, on what needs to happen on both sides in, in order to strengthen those, those links. Um, and then um, Una's question about positive, very positively framed about how to work with aspirational uh, ministers to, 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 to really make good policy. Who would like to pick up on either of those? Um, I think that just one, one point that I think would help on both fronts because actually they're, they're often about having more open dialogues in some ways, both, both questions. 
um, <laughs> is not having to FOI the detail of every cost-benefit analysis that's made in government, irrespective of how sensitive or unsensitive it might be. Um, I think, um, obviously, immigration policy is a very clear example of this recently, where it's actually very, very hard to understand the policy rationale behind it. And I genuinely think, given that it is the sort of policy that could win or lose elections, that it is um, the sort of policy that a, a lot of people are making, coming from what seem very opposing views. But if you speak to them, you sit down and you speak to people that, or you're vox popping people on the street, they believe they want to have a compassionate solution to a, a, di a profoundly difficult problem. Um, and, and people really disagree about how to solve it. So I think having a much, much more openness about both the cost-benefit analysis, the process of arriving at a policy decision would make it much easier for then academics to say, oh, hang on, actually, I've, got, I've, I've literally done a six-year project on exactly that you know, movement of people within East Africa can actually help you in terms of how that might impact other migrationary routes. Or um, I can tell you how, how expensive it's going to be in terms of the, the cost per unit of housing relative to doing that in Skegness. Like, you know, we, we, just, we just can't do that at the moment. And um, as a journalist, sometimes my job is to sort of point out where those gaps lie, if not to fix them. That's <laughs> for people, people, to, people around me. Um, and at the very least, I can't, you know, you're not meant to ask detailed questions. That becomes, a, that becomes an adversarial process. And if it's an adversarial process for me, it must also be an adversarial process for other people within the ecosystem, be that opposition, uh, uh, supposedly opposition parties or other policy makers at a local level. Etc. Does anyone else want to come in on either of those? Just on the, the point about academics, absolutely agree. I mean, one of my sort of big frustrations, I think, with White, so my view of it actually is that it's mostly about the demand side. Um, I think there has been a real shift in universities in the last decade or so. You can look at the impacts of the REF. I know that's not the most popular thing to say with some academics, um, but I think it has led to a change in the way universities think about policy engagement. And you now see a very much more developed structure in terms of university policy institutes and, and actually the work that academics are doing to try and share their research with policymakers. Where my big frustration is, is on the, the government side, because I actually think you can look at a handful of departments and, and you know, senior, some senior officials who do definitely try and maintain connections. And I think if you look at some of the specialists in particular, economists, analysts, they very much more see it as part of their responsibility to be on top of the academic literature. But departments as a whole, really, really poor in the way that they bring, in my view, academic expertise, evidence into policy making. That happens in you know, a bunch of different ways in terms of having links with the universities, but also things like secondments, uh, advisory panels, sort of things like that. Um, I think it doesn't happen nearly enough. I think that your point about the two different cultures is exactly right. And you get kind of skillful academics who are able to kind of bridge, and the same with, same with some policy officials, but I don't think we see it um, nearly enough. Uh, just on the point about manifestos, I do think that's an interesting one. Um, I suppose, you know, probably you want the, the, the man Rachel, interesting what Rachel has to say on this, but you probably want the manifesto to be the starting point of a policy development <coughs> process. And clearly, writing a manifesto and developing a policy are very different things. Um, people writing a manifesto do not have the kind of, you know, they're not trying to develop a fully worked up solution that considers every different aspect. Um, clearly that is the kind of democratic link between the election and the governing party's action. Um, but I think there should be a sort of discussion back and forward, but there's a sort of sensitive thing for officials about how they manage that. And I think that's part of, part of the skill. I think we definitely need to give Rachel yeah, I'm sorry, I I'm to talk about manifestos. Uh, I'm trying to think about uh, how to limit what I say about manifestos. Um, you only have another half hour. So uh, I'm going to say a few things about manifestos then. Uh, at one level, manifestos are a completely absurd construct. I don't think most countries have them. Uh, they're a combination of the way in which we run our elections and I think the way in which we have two houses, one of which basically can't obstruct things if it's in a manifesto, which creates this kind of huge basket that obviously most people do not vote on, um, but then kind of somehow drives the government agenda for the following several years. Um, on the specific question, though, actually manifestos, I think, are a really terrible time to start a policy conversation, as the 2017 election showed. Like, if you drop a massive new policy on social care six weeks before an election, it tends to blow things up. Uh, so... Um, Generally, when people write manifestos, they try quite hard not to introduce new, really difficult things. 
um, as opposed to, you know, nice, shiny tax cuts and promises of more funding um, in the middle of an election campaign. It's something that has to happen a lot earlier, which I think leads to your other point. Now, I would say that generally, in my experience, interestingly, uh, the best new policy making of the kind that makes its way into manifestos happens in oppositions, not when people are already in government. And I think that's partly because of their time and partly because they have something to react to. But I think it's also because when you're in opposition, you have no team, you have no infrastructure underneath you, you have no civil service. So you're forced to spend your time talking to academics and think tanks and people who have quite different ways of thinking about problems to figure out what it is you are going to say. And I think that tends to be much more generative of new interesting policies on difficult topics than when you are trying to run a government department. So, um, I mean, I think there's a whole, you know, huge question about what we do uh, to help MPs and potential future MPs um, become better at hitting the ground running when they become ministers and cabinet ministers and, and how they develop policy. Um, but a fairly obvious thing is to try and make sure they're surrounded by that um, academic think tank and other thought and potentially government thought um, when they have time to think because I don't think ministers have time to think generally. That is something again that we think about a lot of the RFG about how difficult it is to become a minister that nothing really can prepare you for that. Um, was, there wasn't anyone else who wanted to come in for I want to take us back to this accountability question because this is something we are very exercised about that the accountability for policy advice for decisions for outcomes isn't sufficiently clear. And I, I take the, the point that the Paul's made and that the Rachel's made about not all policy being equal on this front, that there are, there's, there's some where it's, it's, it's highly political and it's a degree of blurriness is, is almost inevitable on that front. But um, I'm interested, I had the sense that there's, there's some sympathy with our uh, analysis of the problem, but less with our idea about solutions. I'm interested in the panel's thoughts on how you could clarify um, accountabilities. I feel like I'm talking too much. <laughs> Paul, did you want to come in on this one? Uh, just, um, I'm, I'm just not sure that's the right question to clarify accountabilities. It's a, it's a very functional, slightly linearly assumed kind of, well, if you just get the outputs and the outcomes and all aligned and hold the right thing to account, then that will improve the quality of policy making. I just, I just, I'm not quite sure I'd buy that as the question. Just, just give an example. The um, So so we've, it all, again, I think it, it comes back to what do we mean by policy work? And that is very different in different areas. So yes, you could sharpen accountability in more technical areas, particularly where that is linked to implementation and delivery, service delivery, et cetera. Um, I think I could imagine a world where you sharpen accountability or, you know, to demonstrate that you have really properly gone into the evidence base, that if there's a what work center, which is run RCTs, you have factored that in, you know, all of that kind of thing, totally get. I don't understand how you'd run it necessarily at accountability in terms of those wider, more small p political and deliberative processes that you'd need to go through. You Perhaps you would end up with a sort of, you know, you could have a potentially a sort of what works approach in terms of deliberative techniques and, you know, have you deployed the right one, uh, something like that. But there's also always, I think, a question about um, timescales and complexity. So, um, so, the, so the NAO, I think, does not help in this regard. So the NAO is reasonably good when it's that more simple, linear, you know, here's your input, there's your output, leads to an outcome, here are your performance metrics, da 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 But I remember having real battles um, around NAO reports on trying to take a new approach to the children's services, children's social care system, where we were... Um, you know, trying to do something really quite different in the spirit of devolution, actually, in some regards, and taking away hundreds of pages of statutory guidance written by sometimes not very expert civil servants at the centre and trying to re-empower uh, local areas. And and really, we, we couldn't describe, well, if we do this, then this happens, then that happens, because we were adopting, we were recognising that systems thinking doesn't allow you to do that straightforward linear approach. Now, the NEO hated this. They just wanted me to have a set of 
key performance metrics. Um, and they would, for example, compare what we were doing to the troubled families approach, which was very much driven by hero set performance metrics. And I couldn't give them those performance metrics. And actually, every one they suggested, I ran a regression analysis against it and demonstrated there was absolutely no correlation between what they wanted to call a performance metric and, for example, Ofsted grading, which was probably our best measure of what was going on holistically in the, in the system. Um, and uh, but everything in the system was pushing me to capitulate um, and then have an easier PAC hearing because it was pretty brutal, to be honest, about, you know, why don't you have if you don't have these performance metrics and this accountability system, you do not have a strategy. Um, and we were basically putting an argument that we, we want to brace a more devolved approach and greater levels of complexity. Now, in that case, I think that was the right approach. It wouldn't be the right approach everywhere. But again, it comes down to different policy areas require very different approaches to policy. And, and in my head, it follows quite different uh, forms of accountability. Now, I could have had in my department a head of policy profession uh, saying, look, we need to get the NEO sorted on this, come back with a set of um, KPIs, or you haven't done your job properly, um, which is sort of what the NAO were saying. I think that would have been the wrong approach and done a disservice to the service that we were actually trying to trying to help um, change and improve. Can I, sorry, can I just come in briefly yeah. on that? Um, so, so I think one area potentially sort of where Paul and I might uh, meet is just, I think at the moment, what you have is a departmental head of the, policy profession in each department, but that is a kind of busy director general who has a full-time job, and then that kind of hop role, as it's called, is kind of, you know, at best, a 20th of their role. And actually, I think what we're describing in this discussion is that departments need to be able to think very carefully about how to set up each policy-making process to succeed. I do take Paul's point that the accountability around different types of policy process might need to be different. But I think that's something that you could do if you had someone with a bit more time and capacity who was a kind of policy generalist but sitting across the department with it part of their remit, sort of think about how do I set up each of these teams to succeed depending on the type of, of, of policy area and policy problem that they're, they're facing. Um, so I think at the moment that's missing in departments. And as it, yeah, I, th I think that can sort of lead you down a, a particular route. I just wanted to bring Alex Thomas, who uh, obviously has recent experience of having uh, been in Whitehall and dealt with some of these issues himself and leads our civil service work. Uh, thanks, Hannah, and um, uh, wrote the uh, report with, uh, with, with Tom. So, uh, so a comment and a question, which isn't something I uh, get to say much anymore, but um, uh, I, th I think picking up on this dis discussion, I completely buy the uh, point that Paul and others make about uh, different policies uh, requiring different uh, approaches, uh, and I think part of the art and the skill of a policymaker is to uh, understand and identify uh, which you know which mode you have to operate in, the extent of the um, you know the political parameters within which you're operating for the sort of technocratic policy. But my the thing that was going through my mind as listening to the watching and listening to this part of the discussion is whether the word in this context accountability actually helps us i think this morning when we were talking about statutory underpinning of the civil service and some of the kind of you know uh, harder wiring at the center of the state um uh, accountability uh, works i wonder in this instance if we're talking as much about quality of policy advice and who is responsible for the quality of the advice um I was very struck by a roundtable that we had in preparation of this uh, report uh, at the back end of last year, where it was a mix of civil servants and others, and one of the civil servants on the, in the discussion said that, um, from their perspective, the civil service didn't have its own uh, sort of internal check in the way that a McKinsey or a KPMG or others would have about the quality of the advice that was going to ministers. And it was highly responsive to what particular ministers wanted in a particular area. So if you've got a, um, a rigorous imaginative minister who is going to interrogate your policy advice, you're on your metal uh, and, you, uh, uh, and you need to provide the sort of highest quality of policy advice. If it's an area of less political interest and focus of less ministerial interest, then the civil service isn't as good as it could be at providing that sort of internal check. And I think 
we would see the role of uh, a kind of revived, refreshed head of policy profession. And I should say, I think Paul was probably one of those who devoted more than a 20th of his time to it when he was, uh, when he was doing it. But uh, of, of um, within a department, thinking about that sort of quality. And so it, I think in my mind, that's, that's what I would mean by the accountability. It's, it's who's responsible for the quality of the advice that's going up. And I think then that would play into some of the points that Margaret Hodge this morning was making about not necessarily at the time or in kind of real time, but policy advice being more publicly available, more scrutinisable by Parliament, um, more open to, you know, why did you actually take that decision? On what basis did you take that decision? How, um, how, how far was it based on? the advice that came from the civil service or how far did you push against it? And I think that would be a healthy conversation to have with Parliament and around um, uh, policy making. Scrutiny and also, I think, evaluation within yeah. the Department, not just external scrutiny. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, I mean, I guess going back to the kind of theme earlier about different kinds of policies, I, I can equally imagine quite a few different policies of the last couple of years where a knowledge of how accountability will work might have helped. So to take two, creating a national tutoring service. Um, like knowing who is going to be held accountable over long periods of time for did you hire the right people, did they tutor people and did people learn something doesn't, doesn't seem to me foolish. It is actually quite metricable. Um, the apprenticeship levy where there were a bunch of assumptions that went into its original design about what would happen, many of which did not happen. Happen. It wasn't about whether you thought it was the right policy or not. You had very clear assumptions about what was going to happen and how you were designing policy, um, and then not necessarily a feedback loop once those things didn't happen back to those original assumptions. So I, I suppose, again, I, I think I completely agree with Paul that there are many, many issues where this doesn't work. And where, and I also there are many issues where the kind of specialism point doesn't hold. But there are also a lot where they do. And it'd be really nice to kill off some of that low-hanging fruit so more of us had time to talk about the really hard stuff, um, where I could completely imagine uh, clear accountability that is non-political would be helpful. Thank you. Um, Tom, in your opening remarks, you, you mentioned the Treasury. Mm. And I just wonder if we could touch um, and get the panel's views on the role and sort of culpability of the Treasury in some of the problems we've been talking about. Um, I don't know if you, if you want to expand on it, on it first, but I know we have a view that the Treasury in and of itself promotes a short-term uh, approach to, to policy making, which doesn't necessarily work for some of these big intractable problems mm. that we've been identifying. Yeah, well, I, I suppose the main thing to say, um, and it's sort of easy to um, gain popularity by complaining about the Treasury, <laughs> um, but uh, the main thing to say is we have a very, very powerful Treasury and that it acts uh, you know, as a sort of finance department and as a sort of economics department, and it has a huge amount of influence over departmental policy making and much more than you would see finance ministries in other countries. Um, and I think where that leads you is, um, you know, people in the Treasury will say, oh, we have all these different departments coming to us with you know, their different investor save things, and we have to look at the evidence behind it. But the Treasury's mode of thinking can lead it towards pushing departments to, to basically sort of prioritise short-term outcomes over, over long-term outcomes. And I think that's the big issue for some of the, the long-term policy areas that we're talking about. I mean, aside from we've been talking about lack of political consensus, et cetera, et cetera, is that departments in their sort of spending bids and in their general policy development process are working against a very powerful bulwark that has a particular set of priorities. So just to, to throw one example, recent example, into the mix on this is home insulation. And we've seen, you know, particularly over the current crisis around uh, energy prices, but also actually, if you go back in, in way before that, officials, particularly in Bayes, but other parts of government, absolutely tearing their hair out because, you know, the Treasury simply won't look at the argument around insulating homes better because, they, because of the way they're, they're set up to operate. And I think that kind of replicates across quite a lot of policy areas. So interested in whether the panel agree with this analysis and what we can do about the Treasury. I think I, think I, would, agree, I would agree. I think the, you know, the Treasury, in a sense, is the, uh, is the cross-cut in department, right? I mean, in a sense, I'm, I'm always struck by when you go into the Treasury, which we often do, is that you'll talk to the local growth team and then you'll talk to the productivity team and then you'll talk to the, you know, in a sense, they've got all the teams in the Treasury that the other departments have also 
uh, kind of got. Uh, and I do think there is something in it in, in the Treasury, both being the bookkeeper, you know, the very basic finance department that just you know monitors money in and out as best as it can, and functioning as the economics department and having a view about. Uh, economics, and I'll give you an example. I mean, again, this is a gross generalisation, and there's massive more nuance and all the rest of it. But by and large, the typical Treasury view of the sort of stuff that I work in, local growth, is that it doesn't really add very much to national growth, except where there are very, very clear signals of distress, and distress would be high house prices, uh, congestion in some shape or form, the kind of classic ne negative externalities. Where those are absent or less strong, they would largely then get into a conversation like, do we really need to prioritise investment in that place rather than the not? Which goes back to my earlier point, which is there's an alternative game going on where places are encouraged to advocate for transformative growth, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there is something interesting in the way that the, the Treasury then influences the thinking on some of the agendas, particularly the agendas that, that I tend to, uh, to work on, which needs to be unpacked and better understood, because ultimately they are kind of saying yay or nay on uh, investment decisions, I think. Paul, is this one you wanted to come in on? Um, well, it's probably funny because I, I definitely recognise the the problem, and I say that as someone I think I spent about eight years working in the Treasury. Um, and uh, would, uh, one of the things I sort of reflect on in the, that period I was working in the Treasury is, in some ways, I found it some of the most intellectually challenging work, and I think that was partly because um, the work is is difficult and stretching, and and there are some incredibly bright people working in the Treasury. There are very bright people working right across Whitehall, but it is true that you know your average Treasury official is very very bright. At the same time, I think it was eight years where I was on intellectual autopilot, because actually you are just given a way of thinking, and you know the report talks about the narrow. Whitehall view or the Whitehall parochial view. That is even more the case, I think, in the Treasury. It was once you'd learnt what questions to ask, uh, it was actually very easy. It was actually then very easy moving from team to team as a sort of generalist within the Treasury because it was the same set of questions you'd ask. It is undoubtedly the case there is a default reaction when it comes to public spending. You know, there were, there were always two sort of twin objectives in the Treasury when I was there. One was, um, you know, public public finance is being sound and the other being growth, public finance is being sound always won out in, in internal debates because and, and that drives you to the short term and because most of the things you'd want to invest in in terms of growth take take longer or more speculative and um, more diffuse whereas you know just putting turning the taps off on public spending you can have a much uh, faster reaction so there is a sort of there is a default in there in the system quite how to fix it i don't know and you know it, it's quite hard when you get into these conversations not to end up a little bit back in the sort of territory of that you know, that Nesta paper from 2014 by Stephen Westlake and others, which basically says you need to break the Treasury up. Uh, and, you know, I've got to say, the longer I've been away from the Treasury and the more I have seen it operate, the more sympathetic. I feel reluctant to say I quite like that conclusion um, because I feel a sort of emotional attachment to the Treasury. I spent happy years there. I met my wife there. And yet, and yet, I struggle not to come to the same conclusion as uh, as that paper when I when I um, think about it. Th there's something for me in in this about um, what is the north star of policy making, which is in the sort of DNA of Whitehall, driven by the Treasury. And as I say, it's largely about public finance. Um, and they always have the numbers to back that up. You know, you can you can put numbers around that. So it's a hard measure in the way that more speculative stuff isn't. The Treasury is also quite right that every department comes at them with quite spurious spend to save proposals. They are quite right about that. But that doesn't mean they're all spurious or that some of them aren't worth funding. You know, when you see things like the catch up, you know, the refusal to pay for catch up tutoring, you know, that you sort of think what is going on here in terms of the sort of short term as the Treasury. But in terms of that North Star, I wonder whether there is something that we should be thinking about across the policy domain around resilience rather than efficiency. Um, again, this is this is worth it. So I think Demos have thought a bit about, um, but you know, it, it's a system driven by efficiency at the moment um, rather than resilience. And I think that comes back to the policy making profession as well, and some of this expert versus generalist. So just just to sort of loop it back around. If you're in a world where the sole purpose of the policymaking profession is to serve the government of the day and you've got limited resources, you move people around 
you know, ministers would say they want them to move faster, but you move people around to focus them on the particular policy issues of the day. And and you're sort of, you know, to come back to the earlier idea, the 60-year-old who has quite niche specialist knowledge in something which is not the issue of the day then becomes seen as an overhead. If you had a North Star, which was much more about resilience and stewardship, which is a concept I think IFG is sort of slightly dipping your toes in the water of the concept of stewardship, and I'd love to see you develop that a bit more, um, I think you end up with quite a different set of answers. You, you have to do both. You know, we do have to serve the government of the day through the policy profession. We do have to be responsive and efficient to that. But there is something alongside it about resilience and stewardship, which is really important, which, which you know, goes back to the Treasury mindset, which is all about efficiency, um, you know, in public spending rather than thinking about questions of resilience, which would serve us better in the long term. So, again, the, for me, the two are sort of slightly uh, melded together. Very interesting. Uh, we have a question from Sam. So it's been a, a brilliant discussion this morning and this afternoon. And of course, while we've been talking, coincidentally, the government has all but collapsed and we will have a new prime minister in September. And that's a new opportunity. And I'm just left echoing uh, what I and some others said th th this morning, that, that this is the moment. Uh, post-COVID, uh, globalization, um, uh, digitalization, uh, in this uh, post-Brexit, in this new world for the IFG to take center stage and, and command uh, the high ground and say, this is what government uh, uh, needs to be doing to work better uh, across the different nations and center and locally and regionally to perform a much better job because my writing and understanding about government is that it is fundamentally failing and broken and it needs and could be doing better and the the, the leadership can uniquely come from IFG. It isn't going to come from universities. It isn't going to come from think tanks. They don't have that capacious thinking and experience and contacts and vision that you have. So good luck. It's going to be an exciting <laughs> vision. And, and, can you, and can you solve it by September, please? I think I can maybe ditch the question about interesting ministers back in their agenda of the de on the Declaration on Government Reform. Um, and we'll, uh, you've, ma you've, made, you've made Rachel feel very anxious. What, what have I missed? I'm finding this quite hard. <laughs> Has anything happened in the last hour and a half? Uh, I can your water better. Oh, OK. Yeah, uh, uh, he has gone. OK, uh, I was satisfied. Okay. I was really pleased to be <laughs> OK, we can all move on. <laughs> he hasn't gone. Um, OK, yes, can we? <laughs> back to the topic in hand, Tony. Uh, would you like the... Um, uh, always, as ever, bringing us the breaking news, uh, and indeed the soon-to-be changed government system. But going back, just before we leave the Treasury, I mean, the Treasury was discussed in terms purely of its perhaps suboptimal impact on, poli on pure policy making in the rest of the system. But actually, the policy policies within the Treasury about its own activities, you know, it it, it could be slightly better at, if you think about it. I mean, income tax and national income insurance mergers has been discussed for decades. Business rate reform, business taxation has been discussed on and off. Several reviews, they never go anywhere. I wrote myself a list. Corporation tax it seems to raise more money if it goes up or comes down as a rate, and so on. So I think, uh, in a sense, not only seeing the Treasury in terms of its impact on good policy making in the rest of Whitehall, but also in, in terms of its own capacity to think about itself and its own policy area, I think would be worth adding to the list. Indeed, and tax policy making is something that the IFG has, has also thought a lot about. I think there's one, one last question here, and then I'm going to ask each of the... Uh, and Katie. Uh, Two last questions, quick ones, and then I'm going to ask each of the panel just to, to offer a final reflection. Thanks, Hannah. Um, just really fascinating discussion, and uh, thanks, for Paul, for bringing up the splitting the Treasury. Uh, I spent a long time at IFG saying this is the one um, change you actually need to make structurally. Um, and if you look internationally, you'll find most countries do not have a finance ministry of the type we have or the power, and they do seem to be able to do the basic finance ministry, the various functions um, in, it is necessary. So it's always been a bit of a, an obvious thing. I think the question, though, is what do you want to achieve out of that? 
because splitting the treasury is often done as an administrative change, where it's a fundamentally a political change. You have to take the role of the chancellor and split the role of the chancellor. And that's always been, to my mind, there have been various occasions where we've got close to splitting the treasury, more so than people think over the last uh, 15 years. Um, it's always been the politics that's really driven that. So that's when are we ready to take advantage of a political moment that comes up is going to be an interesting question there. What do we want it to do? Um, I think Tony's absolutely right. You know, that, that what the treasury does itself, I worked on tax policy in the treasury. We had some appalling tax policies uh, because no one was scrutinizing us and saying that's just stupid. Um, and in particular, the burden of administration. It's got actually better over the last few years, so that's fair, fair to the Treasury. But it used to be we, you know, resisting any um, look at administration on business of red tapes, etc. Um, the second thing I think uh, is dear to my heart from IFG days, the functions and how they work, the finance function. There's been some movement to and fro in that. But we lack a strategic finance function in government. We have a cost control function. And we're 20 to 30 years behind where the private sector has moved to in this, in running large and complex organizations. It's a very, very basic function that you really have to have. Um, and if you change some of the infrastructure of the treasury, you could actually get it more interested in what our policy world will call public service reform, our finance world would call actually understanding your inputs to your outputs to your outcomes and how you manage those um, rather than just constrain your inputs. Uh, so some thoughts. Uh, I'm not sure there was a question in there, um, but all very useful. <laughs> One last question here. Uh, thanks. Uh, this, I'm Katie Thorpe. I'm the uh, Head of Learning Development and uh, here at the Institute, and I do a lot of work with academics on helping them to engage with policymakers. And I wanted to echo what Tom said, which was that academics are really trying their best, um, and they are still met with uh, difficulty in just finding any capacity within the civil service to engage with them uh, and to build those connections and networks, which we know are what's really important. Uh, so my question, I do have a question, is... Uh, if there were one investment that you could make in the civil service to improve their day-to-day -day capacity, to find more expertise, to expand their networks, etc., what would that be? Is it about IT, more administrative support, and anything? I know we don't have money to spend, but if we did, what would you spend it on? Great. So if the panel would like to think about their final remarks in the context of that question, that would be great. Do you want to start, Andrew? Yeah, uh, I, I would say, I suppose my final thought is something I said earlier on. I, I, I do think, and I'm not overclaiming because there would be challenges along the way, but I do think taking seriously uh, this notion of devolving responsibilities, powers, resources, etc., down to localities, both as a mechanism for actually making central government better, a, a better version of itself, because then in a sense then, it can focus on some of the things that central government really does need to do, rather than trying to do things that it really doesn't need to be do and isn't very good at doing it. And I think there is a, it's a devolution as a means for making government a better version of itself. Plus, I'm pretty confident that a, a process of devolution in and of itself would make local decision making and local policy making better, in a sense that there would be more reason for those places, however we define them, to take this more seriously and to change the rules of their own game to make themselves better institutions in the short and in the, in the, in the longer term. And just your point on universities, there are lots and lots of places across the country that have fantastic relationships with their, with their local institutions and universities. Go to Sheffield, go to Leeds, go to Manchester, go to Birmingham, go to Bristol. These kind of notions that this is a struggle generally it's not true. The localities have figured out a way how they can draw on the expertise of their, of their universities across different fronts. So again, it's a little bit like it's a problem here at the, the, the national level, less of a problem at the local level. Now, actually, surprisingly, we might need to go to the local level and find out why they have these relationships and whether we can take some of that uh, internally into national level or just accept that these are one of the things that national government is not very good at. Thank you. Paul, you're sort of next, because of where the screen is. Can I come to you next? 
Uh, yeah, thank you. So two parts. Of that. So I'm, I'm conscious, I think I'm the only person on the panel who hasn't talked about devolution and decentralization. Just to say, I completely agree. Um, and actually, if the, you know, Rachel was careful to say that this is not a panacea, I sometimes sit here thinking maybe this is a panacea um, or as close as th that we have to try and solve some of these um, big challenges we have around governance. So just, just to say, it's almost for the record, I 100% endorse those people on the panel who've, who've pushed it devolution uh, as as something we need to think about. I, I mean, I just think the the reason the stakes feel so high about policy making in Whitehall is Whitehall is doing too much policy making, and some of this should be devolved out to to other areas and with great capacity elsewhere. Um, to finish with this, um, an answer to the, the final question about what's the capacity we could build in the civil service and the policy making, slightly tongue in cheek proposal, but only slightly alongside the what works centres. Let's set up a what if centre, which is much more focused on futures and possibilities rather than just the backward facing evidence base to try and develop and grow sort of imagination and creativity capabilities in, uh, in Whitehall. And I'd pay for it by abolishing the NAO. I don't actually mean that bit. That's a very positive uh, vision. Rachel. Uh, so I'll, I'll go back to what I said originally and, and, and echo Andrew. I think um, big, big organisations don't change unless there's external stress put upon them. And uh, I think a lot of what we talk about is much more plausible if we devolve. And that actually, that seems to me a policy you could drive through a leadership election or a, or a manifesto reasonably successfully. Um, on investment, I'll, I'll also give a slight tongue in cheek answer. I think I'm the only person whose mother has succeeded them at the same job in Downing Street. <laughs> and she's a lot better at it than I, uh, I was because she, uh, she is an academic, she's a former academic, <laughs> right, back, current academic, uh, has a lot of expertise uh, in the area that she's focused on. Um, and on the small number of occasions that people like that have been, uh, maybe being slightly less tongue in cheek, on the small number of occasions, and she's not the only one, that people like that have been brought in to government, I actually think their effect has been quite transformative. Hmm. So I think if we just made it the policy to have even 40 of those, it would make a monumental difference to how decisions uh, got made, particularly if some of them also had uh, some understanding of the public and the people who were um, experiencing services, as well as uh, what works in a more formal sense. Anna. Um, uh, it's, it's a slightly unrelated point, but I, I suppose I would, in, um, as, a, as a summary point, I'd say that um, you know some of some of the big four that have nailed uh, the more technical areas of consultancy, um, they are innovating their way to solve government's problem by hiring the best staff and calling them technical directors, um, and um, I think that shows you how you can have a, a a model of promotion for people whose areas are technical expertise. Um, and that if they are good at being technical experts, that you don't force them to be managers as well. I haven't really touched on that so much, but often a lot of the problems with being creative and innovative is that you're trying to make sure that people have got their leave booked in. Um, so um, I'd, I'd, I'd do that. Um, I would, um, instead of having a head of policy, I'd have a head of treasury in each department, where what they do is they, they, they work with the art of the possible, which is you're not going to scrap this enormous machine overnight. So what you do is you make sure that every high priority policy has its counter argument pre-prepared so you can meet the treasury off at the advance. Um, and that I don't need to worry about a lot of this because net zero is going to completely change the way we account for policy because you won't be able to force any of that off of the treasury's balance sheet. That's going to become the way that every credit agency in the world profiles a country. Um, and it's going to be long term in a way that nothing else will be. Um, and so I think a lot of our concerns and arguments are going to be um, <laughs> forced out into the, in, in, into the world as very real, very immediate problems. Um, and I also think things like that, Joe, will solve actually some of the intergenerational um, challenges we have in terms of um, various like attitudes to age as well. Mm. Yeah. Tom, you've got two minutes before I hand over to Lord Sainsbury to uh, give just, us some final words. I, I, I think uh, the point on net zero is a great one, and the question is when the Treasury sort of wakes up to, <laughs> to that fact, I think. Um, I had three brief things that I'm going to take away in particular. Um, the first is on this whole discussion around scale and devolution. I think there is a real challenge back to the IFG to kind of join up some of our th thinking on, on policy making and what's going wrong there with some of our ana analysis of devolution and actually think about some of the ways in which the state trying to do too much at the central level um, that cuts across all of these different problems that we've analysed and thinking about the role of devolution in that. Um, I think that's really interesting. I think the second one is around accountability and the challenge, the discussion we've had today 
and how that can work for different types of policy um, and different types of policy problem. Uh, I think Paul is absolutely right to bring up the term stewardship. Uh, definitely something we're hoping to do more than dip a toe into. Um, so I think that's probably the sort of part of the direction there is to sort of think about that, that balance in that slightly different way. And then the third, um, which I expect David might mention as well, is policy expertise. Um, so it's, I think it's definitely specialist policy expertise that we're focusing on in those technical areas. Um, we've talked about a bunch of ways to do that and to join it up with Katie's question. Um, my one thing in terms of bringing academics better in, I think that you, well, sorry, there's two. <laughs> the, often the culture in the department doesn't encourage it. That's not a money thing. But the one thing I think that's quite simple that you could do is very many policy officials simply don't know who to pick up the phone to. They've got you know, a week, two weeks to go away and come up with something. Simply having networks in each department that said, this is a sort of 150, 200 plus academics, and these are all the areas that they're experts in, and this is their phone number. This is the person who knows them in the department and can provide you with an introduction, and your senior manager telling you that you are, yes, you are able to go and talk to them about the policy that you're working on, and that not being something to be scared of. I think that would be a, a, a really you know, a useful addition to civil servants trying to do this better. Great. Can I invite Lord Sainsbury to give us some final closing thoughts? First of all, I think it's been an enormously uh, productive uh, conference in spite of the uh, perhaps uh, far from ideal circumstances. <laughs> in fact, I think it says something rather good about this country that as the government is exploding, a, a group of us are prepared to spend the day sitting here uh, discussing the long-term reform uh, of the civil service. It suggests there is some priorities left. Um, I was... I thought that some very good points came out of, of the conference. I was struck very much by the comments of St. Jonathan Jones about how, in these circumstances, uh, the law can't solve things, but it certainly can provide a structure uh, for resolving issues. And I think in this, this whole area of the relationship between ministers uh, and civil servants, this is a very important uh, problem. It doesn't solve the issue, but at least gives a framework uh, for considering these issues. And I actually thought Nick uh, Herbert's point this morning that uh, we need to convince politicians that actually there's real value for them in this type of discussion, because if they want their policies delivered, uh, you need to have a mechanism uh, for doing so. Uh, and so it's really valuable for them to get the machinery working. Um, there's only one point I would like to um, have a final word on in this discussion, and this is what appears to be an agonizing discussion about a generalist versus specialist. And I can only tell you about my own experience in this. Um, two things. One is I've always had a great interest in technical education. Um, way back in uh, 2014, I was rung up by Nick Bowles, who was then the a junior minister in charge of technical education. And he said, I want to do something about technical education, which was which is good. And he then said, but I have no one in the department who knows about technical education. And when you think about that, I mean, that's an extraordinary uh, statement. It turned out to be actually totally accurate. And he said, um, uh, I'd like, would you come along and talk to me about technical education? So I went along with him, and I took along the, the person who runs technical education in my charity. We had a very useful dis discussion. And um, uh, afterwards, uh, he rang me up and said, could you second this person you brought along called Nigel Thomas knows about technical education, and could you second him uh, to the department? And uh, I said, of course, yes. Um, and then he suggested uh, that we have an independent panel uh, which would review technical education, and I would chair that. So we agreed that. And we set that up, and then we had a team of civil servants to come and help us, uh, who were all enormously enthusiastic and bright, but knew nothing about technical education. And the end result of that was we wrote a report. Uh, myself, Nigel Thomas, 
and Rachel's mother, <laughs> uh, who knows about technical. <laughs> uh, and uh, we, we wrote this report. And then um, I went to government and it agreed, and it was implemented. Uh, well, uh, I won't go into the next bit of the story was how it was implemented. But, but just think about that. This is the Department of Education saying it doesn't know, have people who know about uh, technical education. And it's, it's, I have to say, that coincides entirely with my own experience working uh, in the department, um, what was then the DTI, on science and innovation policy. And on many occasions, um, I've sat there with civil servants and found myself saying, yeah, but who in the department actually knows about this issue? And you would have to clear away uh, layers of generalists to find the person who actually knew about the issue. So I don't think there's a conflict between generalists and specialists. You need to have people who know about the subject. Now, if on top of that, they have more general skills and knowledge about the whole system of government, uh, politics and so on, that is a plus. So it should be said that if the ministers are doing anything, that's what they're supposed to, to know about. So this idea that we can have kind of generalists floating around giving advice, um, in, I have to say in my book, is not what it's about. It's about people who know what the subjects are and who also ideally have that broader view in which they, they can put that. That's my just one uh, contribution to this, this debate. Uh, where are we now? Um, I think this has been very useful, this conference. Um, I think everyone agrees there is a problem. I don't hear any particular arguments about the two areas we're putting forward saying these are wrong. And I haven't heard any uh, proposals saying, no, no, there is a different way that uh, you've got to um, reform things. So I'm uh, enthused uh, on, take, on the Institute taking forward these issues uh, strongly uh, on the next, uh, in, over the next few years. And I think we need the support of everyone who's interested in this area uh, of civil service reform to turn the thing around uh, so people really begin to take these issues uh, seriously and do something about it. And if there's one general comment, finally, I'd like to make, it is that in all these things, uh, whether it's policy making or the way the civil service runs, the most fundamental thing is to focus on the underlying uh, problems. Um, let me give you an example of this. In the Decl Declaration of Civil Service Reform, it says, we will invest in training for civil servants and for ministers with high standards for online provision as well as the creation of a new physical campus. Uh, now, leaving aside the rather childish point that actually this same government or previous version of it actually abolished uh, the campus and the training of, of um, civil servants, uh, that's not the problem. The problem you should ask yourself is why isn't the training taking place of the civil servants and, and ministers? And the underlying problem for that is there is no one's responsibility in the civil service to provide this training. So the most important thing in all this is keep a view of what is the underlying problem. And I think that in these two papers, what we've focused on is the underlying problems. These are the ones that have to be tackled. And that's why I think uh, they're very important and why the Institute uh, is going to be focusing them on the next few years. And perhaps a final point, the Institute is not going to go away. <laughs> We're going to focus on these for the next 20 years and get them right. Thank you very much. Well, and hopefully it won't take us 20 years. Um, can I thank the panel um, on all of uh, your behalves um, and encourage everyone either in the room or online. Uh, we have two excellent events coming up soon. Tomorrow we have uh, Theresa May is coming to give a, a memorial lecture uh, uh, in memory of James Brokenshire on the theme of public service. 
Uh, so do join us online for that. Um, and next week, we have uh, Bronwyn Maddox, our director's valedictory uh, lecture. So you'd also all be very welcome to join us for that. Um, and with that, I think we'll uh, finish. Thank you. Thank you.